Hello, hello. All right. I think we're going to get started now. Thank you very much for having me to the ForwardJS organizers. Uh, my name is Todd Margolis. I'm a product manager at Click. And uh, we do have a booth downstairs that I hope you'll come by, check it out. Um, we could show some of what I'm going to talk about today, which is immersive analytics. Um, but really, I'm showing much more of an experimental kind of prototype or proof of concept of what you can do with our traditional platform. Um, so I'm not going to you know, talk too much about the, the primary use cases, how most of our customers, or pretty much all of our customers, use Click today. I'm really projecting forward into how people may be doing data analytics in the future. And using our platform as one example to, as, as really showing you examples that, that I've built as prototypes on our platform. I, uh, I also call myself a, or have been called a transmedia producer. Um, and I'm going to talk a lot about uh, what may or may not be. A lot of what I do is really highly speculative, which is funny because our legal people let me get away with pretty much saying anything because nothing that I really talk about is really in the product today or something, maybe a product that we're going to sell today. It's really more, again, speculating about how this is, is moving forward. Um, so I've been uh, creating these sort of virtual platforms um, and systems and content uh, for over 20 years. My first VR experience was actually back in 1992 in the cave. Um, and uh, I primarily was an academic before this, um, so teacher and researcher at uh, several universities in the West Coast. Um, and, uh, and I just really love making stuff. Um, so actually, this visualization on the left here is showing a, a visualization um, of our open source developer community, uh, Click Branch. So each one of those little nodes there represents a project that someone made based on our APIs. Um, and the links that you see there show the, diff the users, um, like there'd be a, a link between a user who created multiple projects. And one of the coolest things that I found by building this visualization was that we discovered that our developers are actually working across our entire ecosystem of products. They're not just building data visualizations for ClickSense, or they're not just building data connectors for ClickView, but they're actually working across the whole uh, platform, which was really kind of cool and exciting and somewhat surprising to me. Um, so on my day job, really, I am a product manager uh, focused on collaboration. So these are some of the driving principles that guide my everyday work um, as far as actual new features that we're building into our product. Um, and you know, these are the different types of highly collaborative, multi-user um, sort of environments that we like to support. Um, I kind of think of collaboration in these three different forms, right? And so this sort of broadly shapes the conversation of collaboration. Um, thinking of offline as asynchronous, right? So we can communicate via like email or even maybe instant messenger or Slack is sort of this quasi-synchronous, asynchronous thing. There's sometimes not as much of an expectation that someone responds immediately um, on some of the, the more current platforms. That's a form of collaboration. Um, inline is when everyone's in the same room. So you can see in this example, and I actually have a video here that I'll bring up uh, showing some other forms of local collaboration. And For some of the fascinating uh, we work that we've been doing audio in three. That. I'll cut it out. All right, thank you. Um, there we go. So this is just an example of multiple people. That's actually me with longer hair on the right, um, interacting with click on multiple touch screens. So you can imagine in command and control scenarios, um, being able to have a large group of domain experts all in the same room, um, or maybe not all in the same room. And how do you support them if they're um, remote telecollaboration into the same environment as well? Um, so inline, offline, um, and online being remote is, is the other main one here. So just real fast, uh, these are some of the new features that we're building into the Click platform. So the ability for people to do reporting, we already have that. I'm adding new features. 
um, to be able to share insights easily. So let's say you're doing some analysis and you want to be able to share. Um, the key from a developer perspective is all of these new things that we're building, it's really not that you have to do it inside of our client UI. Uh, we're building the services, so things like scheduling services, alerting services, rendering services, triggering services, and then we're building APIs on top of that. And then we're building examples, and those examples may exist in our product, so you go to a click app on a website and you can interact with it, through it that way. But we're also really interested in reaching out and working with developers to extend that. So for example, you can share um, you know, an insight into Slack, but what about like Chatter or Yammer or you know, other instant messaging or messaging platforms? Um, so providing examples and really good documentation and then working with partners and developers to reach the other places. Um, so the, the key is really getting the, delivering the right information to the right people at the right time, in the right place, and especially with the right context. And so these are some of the new features um, that we're doing to, to help with that. So that's all good for your traditional BI of today, um, but you know, this word big data gets thrown around a lot, and it's really cliche now. Um, so I actually like to talk a little bit more about complex data. And so that's like n-dimensional data. It may be data that you don't even know necessarily what you're looking for. It's more discovery-based analytics. Um, and one of the first problems that you have is that you lose context. Um, so when you're actually trying to make selections, um, you start, and sometimes you know, you've got hundreds or maybe even thousands of different fields that you're working with, um, and you start to lose an insight of what are the previous selections you made, what are the previous understanding insights. Um, the other challenge is generalizing beyond what's already known. Um, and so being able to, again, focus more on discovery than traditional analytic workflows. And then finally, the last one is really about, you know, we have a difficult time communicating those insights. And so that's one of the biggest challenges is being able to, once you understand something, how can you easily share that insight um, with others through storytelling and other things? So this is, what we're, we're working on is something called augmented intelligence. Um, and that's leveraging advanced analytics, so things like maybe predictive, um, clustering, and being able to bring those into these virtual worlds or immersive spaces and give average users, average business users, an easier way to um, utilize those and understand what controls uh, or what effect the controls that they have make. So that's the challenges. So the proposition is to really turn it inside out. So advanced analytics is becoming more and more of a black box, right? Um, because of all the challenges I just mentioned, um, it's very difficult for developers or users to take advantage of that, right? You have to really specialize in some of these, you know, Bayesian techniques, for example, um, to really know how to use it. But if you, what we want to do is really democratize that, make it platform agnostic, make it easier, um, more intuitive for people to use it, um, and really reach a wider audience, not just for data scientists, but for anybody. So we call this immersive analytics. Um, and what that means is being there, and by there I mean an immersive environment. And again, that could be a combination of people all in the same space, people in multiple locations, people working all at the same time or at different times. And to really generalize uh, with others, so both local and remote, as I mentioned, um, and specifically to find new meaning. That's what I mean by generalize. Um, finding new insights. And again, complex data is what we're focused on. So these are some of the properties that uh, an immersive analytics environment may look like. So we've got, uh, it's gotta be engaging and sticky um, so that people will kind of come back to it. Um, it should be always on, right? Most data is dynamic, it's changing all the time. Um, and so how can you actually keep that world sort of fresh and sort of, sort of that it always is showing the latest data, but it doesn't forget past data, or it doesn't specifically forget the actions that you've taken in that space previously, right? Should be obviously uh, information rich and high density, um, but not just sort of cliche. So for example, um, just 
taking data and making like a 3D bar chart or a 3D pie chart isn't what we're suggesting here. It's really finding the best way to do data visualization that's specific to the data and the understanding that you're looking for. And so I'll show a few more examples of what I mean by that later. And of course it needs to be highly interactive, um, meaning that it's not just about rendering out this static image, uh, it's something that should be responsive as you actually interact with it and in the context in which you interact with it. So we've got augmented reality, that's one form factor. We've got virtual reality as another form factor. We've got mobile and tablet and laptops as other form factors. So a lot of people talk about responsive design, right? I'm sure most of you are familiar with that, but probably the majority of you think of responsive design as a way of optimizing the experience as you scale down right? Making something look good on a small resolution device. What about scaling up and scaling out? How does something respond when you actually look at it on a projection screen, like say that covered all the walls in this room, right? What happens if it's in a virtual environment where there's literally no walls? It's 360 degrees all around you. So it's a new form of uh, approach for designing for responsive. And of course, what happens if you've got multiple users looking at that same visualization? Um, it's gonna, should it always look the same? If I'm looking at it and you're looking at it, you're looking at it from one side in this virtual world, I'm looking at it from another side. How do we know what the other person is seeing or more importantly, what they're pointing to? So, when we were actually building it, you have your multiple designers You've got many different middleware platforms, so are any of you familiar with Unity 3D? Show of hands. Yeah, it's a pretty good amount of you, great. Um, so that's for those of you who haven't heard of it before, it's a common uh, IDE for building, a lot of people use it for game development. Um, you can use it for all kinds of other app development as well. Um, and what's nice about it is that you can target different platforms. So you kind of build once, and then you can deliver it to, let's say, the Oculus Rift, or Gear VR, or Microsoft HoloLens, or Android, or iOS. Um, it's very multimodal, right? And then there's a couple other I've, I've added here. Um, but where's the, there's the analytics that should come into that, right? So we have examples that connect to things like R or Python, as well, of course, as our own ClickSense platform. And then from there, again, you can go to all of these different environments. So this one on the right is a Cave 2. So that's an environment that's got about 40 screens. They're all 3D. You walk into a room, and it's kind of like the holodeck. Um, everything that you experience in that room is 3D. You can interact with it. Um, you need to interact with people both locally and remotely. So let me show you an example. I have to load up the next video. Hi, I'm Todd Margolis with Blake, and I'm here to show you some example uh, that we have for immersive analytics. This uh, demonstration is focused on a manufacturing use case, looking at uh, reading real-time IoT data uh, for a virtual manufacturing plant. You can see that we have a widget moving through the factory along the conveyor belt, and there's various sensors reading its current state at different locations throughout its manufacturing process. You can see that I can move around within the environment, and I would be normally wearing an Oculus Rift to see this, uh, but it's harder to record that. So you'll see that there's the status code up top. If there is a reading on the uh, sensors that looks like we're going to lead towards a failure, it's possible for me to look at the power controls here and actually be able to interact with them and turn them off as needed. You'll notice now if I turn around and look at the plant, everything has stopped. You can see the uh, widget on the conveyor belt over there has stopped, and all of the conveyors have stopped moving as well. This allows a plant manager to go out and fix any problems 
uh, with the sensors or machines. And then we can return to the power control and restart it. You'll also notice that we have the ability to look at some detailed QuickSense analytics. So if I travel over here to our dashboard, we can actually see different types of information being streamed in real time to QuickSense. So this is just a quick mashup. On the top, we've got the real time streaming data. In the middle, we're looking at a short term window of all the data in the application just for the current uh, widget on the, show, uh, the shop floor. And on the bottom, we've got a long-term historical view of all of the data that's come through um, the plant. Okay, so I'm gonna stop it there. Um, this is maybe an okay example. It's not ideal. Um, this is a, to be honest, a kind of lazy demo. Um, so really, all we're doing right here is taking a 2D chart or dashboard um, and bringing it into virtual reality. There's not too much kind of native 3D capabilities that I'm actually using here. Um, and also the other problem is, you know, what's the real benefit of bringing this into VR? Honestly, there's not that much right now. Um, but imagine if you have global manufacturing, right? And you've got factories all over the world or you've got distribution centers all over the world that you want to manage then maybe it becomes a little bit more useful, right? You can bring all of those into one virtual world, be able to control um, and troubleshoot problems that happen anywhere in the world, all side by side from one location, right? All right, so I'm gonna back up and maybe talk about why this is relevant and how we got here. So a little bit of uh, history. This isn't really a, a new concept. Um, so I think of immersion really in two forms. One is the sensorial side of immersion and the other is the social. So first we're gonna talk about sensorial. So I actually think of Stonehenge as one of the earliest examples of immersive analytics, right? So imagine being able to walk inside of this very large data visualization, which is what Stonehenge probably is. We don't actually know exactly what Stonehenge was used for, um, but we think that it probably had something to do with understanding astrological events, um, things like that, and maybe other meanings as well. But it was some sort of data visualization. There was information encoded in that that people had to, to use and interact with to understand. We could also think of the abacus as one of the various earliest forms of a interactive data visualization device. All right. But now things have become much more complex, right? It'd be almost impossible for me to describe what's happening in this chart without just showing you that chart, right? So we start to understand that specific types of visualizations necessi are ne necessi uh, excuse me, <laughs> necessary um, based on the, the complex data that you're trying to communicate. And at Click, we actually help you with that process. Um, so we actually have some of these that we're gonna be handing out later, but this is, a handy little guide um, that, based on what type of data you're looking at and what you're trying to do, are you trying to compare data? Are you looking at over a time period? Um, are you looking at you know, uh, distribution? There's different types of visualizations that help guide you towards um, answering the right sort of question. And I think this is actually really important because we tend to, um, you know, w without working specifically with designers who may already know this, um, a lot of engineers don't necessarily have the, the right tools um, to, to use the right visualization type. But even this is limited, right? As you get towards more complex forms of uh, an analytics, you need more complex forms of visualization. And so this is uh, one way in which we have our open source branch developer community help with us. So, Built on top of the Click platform, we've got hundreds of different types of visualizations that people have used to do that. Now, downstairs, you can actually get one of our Google Cardboards. Um, we're handing those out. And you can see one of the examples that I built uh, was looking at a globe um, in 3D, right, using your own phone inside of a Google Cardboard. And you can see access to clean water per country over, over time. Um, and it's very simple visualization, nothing fancy, um, but it's something that looking at it in 3D actually makes it a little bit easier to understand the relationships between different regions and different countries to each other. 
So on the other side, thinking of social immersion, um, you know, currently it, it's, we're in a sort of a limited period right now as far as the data visualization side goes. Um, most people think of reporting um, in this kind of old school way, but I like to think of it more as sharing. Um, and by, what I mean by that is storytelling specifically for the sake of collaboration, right? It's not a passive uh, experience. It should be something that's very active. And so it's specifically about building communal knowledge. And this isn't a new idea either. So anybody have any idea of what this image is here that I'm showing? Anyone want to guess, yell it out? Close, very close. Um, so this is a data visualization, but no one would really know that. If you actually talk to the creators of it, they probably wouldn't talk about it in that way. Um, so does anybody want to guess who the oldest living um, continuous culture is on this planet? Oh, wait, yeah. They're what, reef? Yes, you're very, very close. Yep, it's Australian Aboriginals. Um, so they're sometimes referred to as dreamline, storylines, um, but they're these type of dot paintings that Aboriginals have been painting for tens of thousands of years. And they're still doing it. This is literally the oldest continuous culture on this planet. Um, and this is how they encode information, right? So they've been passing these visualizations on for eons, literally eons, um, to their children. And what's interesting about this is that it's not a trivial, sort of easy visualization to understand. There's actually many, many layers of information encoded into this image. And it actually takes people lifetimes to understand all the information that's encoded in this. Um, it could be, you know, some of the information, I think someone said rivers earlier. That's obviously one of the most important things that they would want to encode in these um, dot paintings is where's water, right? That's critical, especially in the outback where there's not a lot of water. Um, it's important to understand where that is, right? But it's a lot more than that. Um, and the point is, is that in their culture, it's very different than the traditional kind of Western mindset of understanding, you know, the way the sort of teacher listener relationship is set up, um, there's a lot of responsibility actually on the quote unquote student, the person receiving the information, they're not passive. Um, it's incumbent upon them to actually actively engage and question the data that's being told. And I think that's what's sort of missing right now, um, especially when it comes to things like you know, political information. I'm, I'm just going to temporarily get on my soapbox for a second. Um, so whether, you know, you're left-leaning or right-leaning, alt-news or, or sorry, fake news or <laughs> alt-facts, um, either side is sort of having difficulty understanding and appreciating what's a fact, right? Um, what's the truth? What's even the meaning of truth? And I think that this concept of sort of active, collaborative, listening is part of that, right? Being able to actually engage with people on both sides um, to find what, what is the underlying meaning. And this isn't you know, something that's necessarily new, as I'm trying to say with Aboriginals, but it, this also goes back to cave paintings and storytelling, um, the oral tradition of storytelling. You know, stories change, right? Especially, you end up mythologizing stories. So in these cave paintings, you've got um, stories of the great conquests of you know, different tribes. They may have been exaggerated over time. Um, and that process is still happening today. Right? Is anyone familiar with the Internet Archive? Yeah, a few people. That's good. So for those that aren't, I highly encourage you to check it out. It's, uh, it's weird um, using it. So it's basically a archiving service for the web. Um, they've been basically scraping the internet um, for as long as possible. Um, and we're talking, I think, back to the early 90s, or at least, or maybe even earlier than that. Um, and actually taking sort of static snapshots of websites, what they look like. So for example, this is the New York Times homepage in 1996, right? And it's interesting even just looking at this, because at that point, you know, people were building websites that basically mimicked print media, right? This kind of just looks like a newspaper, um, but it's actually their homepage. 
And fast forward to more current times, this is one of the New York Times articles that actually won a Pulitzer Prize. Um, and so it did so because it's actually really progressive in the way in which it communicated a story. And that was done not just through text, but it, it also incorporated you know, multimedia images, video, motion graphics. Um, but most importantly, it also incorporated user kind of response and feedback. So it was a dynamic story in which people who were reading the story were able to annotate and footnote um, and have threaded conversations throughout the entire story, right? And you know, there's an example that we all know, Wikipedia, um, that is probably the best example of this highly interactive form of immersive storytelling, right? So how can we take this into these immersive virtual worlds? Um, and why would we want to even do that? So this image is a representation of something called the method of loci. Is anyone familiar with that or what this image actually is? Has anyone heard of this thing called a memory palace? A couple of people shaking their head. Yeah, so this is a mnemonic technique, um, which is a, a memory technique. It's a way in which it, it helps you remember things better. Um, and so the idea is that you use a kind of spatial layout to understand uh, or to remember things. So for example, in my memory palace, I might have you know, experience of this conference presenting to you, I might store that in my living room on the side table next to the brown couch, right? Um, and then when I'm here tomorrow, I might have another experience that I'll put, you know, on the other side of the table, right? And as I navigate in my mind the memory palace, that helps me remember, you know, the different experiences and the details of those experiences. So the idea is, you know, maybe we can do a similar sort of thing with the data that we interact with in our daily lives. So what happens if we actually started to put databases into a spatial temporal layout, right? If I can actually walk around this virtual world, does that same technique, that same sort of muscle memory of being able to navigate a space and understand that this data is connected to that data, and here's where I had that insight, and here's where I shared it with so-and-so, if we actually mark those things into a, a three-dimensional environment, there's a strong argument to be made that that will actually increase our ability to be more analytical with that data. So if we want to create these new forms of uh, visualization, it's not going to be easy. Um, there are a lot of challenges. Um, so we're very used to using um, heads-up displays and two-dimensional representations of text and visualizations. Um, it's not just a technical problem, but it, it's really a social problem. So, um, you know, are people even ready to walk around wearing, you know, HoloLens, or they definitely weren't ready to walk around using Google Glass, right? There's a big kind of revolt against the glass holes. Um, and, uh, and then there are some kind of uh, more physiological challenges, like you, parallax is the problem of, you know, imagine you've got a line chart, um, and something maybe, oops, I just, oops, sorry. Um, something like this, um, so that's, a, that's a really difficult thing to visualize. Um, and parallax makes it actually in some ways more difficult um, because of what that is is things tend to go towards infinity when you're looking at something. So you actually can't see the subtle changes in a line um, as things are moving away from you. So let me show one other example now. Oops. down on this so I can talk over it. Oops. Okay. Um, so, have you heard of a guy named Craig Vettner? It's a pretty famous uh, scientist. He's the guy who cracked the human genome. After he did that, he worked on this project called the Global Ocean Survey. And he basically circumnavigated the globe on his boat. And he picked up little samples of water along the way 
did what's called shotgun sequencing on the microorganisms in the water. It basically removes all the other stuff and just looks at the proteins in there. By doing this, he over doubled humanity's previous knowledge of proteins, right? Huge new data set. And it was so big and so complex that the traditional scientific methods, sort of hypothesis-driven methods, didn't really work because we were, we were forced to really confront the big questions like you know, origin of life, unity of species, things like that. Um, and so we got a National Science Foundation grant to build an entirely new platform to explore this data set. Um, and it was a large collaborative team that I was the technical director for um, to basically throw out our old you know, preconceived notions of how to look at, uh, at especially any data, but specifically in this case, it was protein data. Um, and it was really based on metadata. So we were looking at metagenomics, but we were looking at the metadata of metagenomics. And what that means is that everything that you were seeing there, um, especially in that first part, if I maybe back it up a little bit, in that particle system, is all moving around on its own. So you can see me moving my hand around in there, um, and I'm sort of probing the data. But all those lines that you're seeing in the clusters, um, those were all basically determined by the data itself, right? Uh, they're different forces based on the relationships of the data. So metadata could be things in this case like salinity, temperature of the water, um, the habitat type of the water. And when, if you see a pattern that is interesting, then you can make a selection. And the reason why this is important is that humans are still really good at seeing signal and noise, right? We're really much better than computers at actually identifying what's of interest and what's not of interest, because we don't even necessarily know what's of interest, right? And that was part of the point of this. So if I just pause it here, oops, uh, I was a millisecond too late. If I back it up, so on this screen, this is once I've made a selection, we're dynamically generating these 3D forms. Um, and those shapes aren't, they're not, molecular representations. Again, these are um, procedurally created shapes uh, based on the metadata. So you don't have to know what the underlying mapping is. Like, I don't have to know that a triangle means this or, you know, this higher level of detail means that. Scientists, you might want to learn that later, but the first thing you want to do is just see similarity and difference, right? So I can say this color is similar to that color, which is also similar to that color. You know, these two shapes here are somewhat similar. Um, you know, that's very different than everything else around it. So instantly, humans can see those things, right? We just, we don't know why we're interested, but we can at least spot similarities and differences. And from there, then you can actually probe further, and that's what the next selection is, um, where you can kind of delve deeper and deeper. And the key to this is what we call detail and context. So if I actually just pause it. Um, I think you'll, it's a little bit hard to see here. Um, but in addition to kind of getting more detail about this one, we can see its path through the larger data set. Um, and this was done back in uh, 2003, I think. Something like that. No, that's too late, sorry, too early, 2007. Um, and so we're looking at tens of millions of uh, proteins here. And that might not sound like big data. It's not big data today. If you go back a decade, that actually was a lot of data, especially if you're thinking about interacting with it in real time. Um, and so it was a, a big challenge to do that. And then you're actually seeing that path through all of the other data, right? And then you can send it back and ask more questions. So this project actually was quite successful. Um, we ended up showing it at museums and conferences and schools to hundreds of thousands of people, including um, you know, students and kids, like K through 12 uh, students to just learn about general science, as well as used by metagenomics uh, scientists to make actual scientific discoveries. Um, and so I think that that serves as a pretty good example of um, what we can do with immersive analytics. So um, I'm going to wrap it up soon, but I want to, again, focus on uh, Click Branch and Playground, where we have a whole lot of examples of this kind of immersive analytics. Um, we have an open source developer community and GitHub account uh, for immersive analytics. Um, and I am going to show one last demo. Now, unfortunately, I wanted to show this demo live, 
Um, this is with the Microsoft HoloLens. And this is uh, obviously made by Microsoft. Um, it's one of the newer forms of augmented reality headsets out there. And uh, I, got, I was lucky enough to get one of the very early uh, first wave of developer um, whatever kits. And I built something using the Click platform. And unfortunately, there's still a lot of problems with the networking. Um, and I've tried four different networks here, and none of them <laughs> have worked for streaming um, it so that you can see what I see. So I could show the demo, but it'd be very boring for you because you wouldn't actually see what I'm seeing. So instead, I'm going to show you a pre-made video of what it looks like. And then I encourage you all to come down to the Click booth downstairs at any time today or tomorrow, and you can actually try it firsthand. Okay? Okay. So here we are, and, and I'm going to bring the sound down. So the first thing that I'm just showing right now is um, just looking at standard click apps. So this is just in Microsoft Edge inside of augmented reality. Okay, So I'm just looking in my office here, and I can interact with all of these uh, um, charts. And I apologize, I, I'm making myself nauseous right now. This was not a great video. I'm looking all around. It's important when you're shooting video to other people to like be really slow and steady with your head movements. Um, but I can interact and make selections and everything updates, right? So this is just out of the box, easy functionality. This is it's kind of boring. Um, what I want to show you is a custom application that I made. Oh wait, the funny thing that I was hoping to show. Oh, where's our little monkey? Uh, anyways, there's a little monkey eating pizza um, watching this as well. All right, so it's in Unity. There we go. So now I'm looking in my room, and we've got a custom app made just for HoloLens based on the Click platform. And so the thing that I'm looking at here is for, um, it's for people in emergency medical uh, scenarios, right? So doctors and nurses out in the field responding to a disaster, like let's say a fire or earthquake or something like that. I think all, everyone would agree giving people like that more better access to, to complex more data um, in an intuitive way is a good thing. Um, so that's what we did. And this visualization shows the different procedures that that doctor could take based on that individual patient, right? And what I mean by that is using this app, you can dynamically filter through um, the symptoms of that patient. So you can say, what's their approximate age? Um, you can look at the admission types that, you wanna, uh, that you're interested in. You can look at if they're male or female, or responsive or bleeding, and all that kind of stuff, um, until you drill down to get the specific procedure path that is guaranteed to have the best outcome based on a whole lot of data. right? So you can interact with it via voice. You can interact with it using the air tap gesture that Microsoft supports. Um, and then instead of, in addition just to seeing that, that sand key, um, you can also hear a, a voice, a, what is it, natural language generation um, summarizing what's happening in that chart. Um, so. I hope that you'll come downstairs to check it out. And with that, I'll say thank you.